Good morning, church. Let's stand up together and let's worship God this morning. Come on. God, here we are right now in this moment to worship you. Here I am to worship. Here I 
of our King today.
You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. And I love that we ended on that last um, statement, Jesus, you change everything. It's true. And every Sunday we get the opportunity to celebrate that fact that because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection, nothing has been or ever will be the same. So this morning, I wanna encourage you to take your bread, take your juice, and just out of a spirit of thanks, remind yourself that Jesus has changed everything. He's changed how we connect with God. He's changed how we connect with other people. He's changed the hope that we have. And that is what we celebrate here in these moments of communion. I would love to pray for us. And I just wanna ask that you take some time before you take the bread and the juice and you just remind yourself I mean, because of Jesus' death on that cross, everything has changed. Let's pray. God, right now we come before you. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for sending Jesus to the cross to die the death that we could never pay for. God, the penalty for our sins. We thank you for the righteousness that Jesus had. And Lord, at the end of the day, we are so thankful how everything changed not only when he died, but God, when he resurrected for us. God, we remember that sacrifice now. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
right, well, good morning, church. Good morning. Can we give it up for our worship team this morning? These guys are great. Yes. Well, hey, I want to welcome you to Community Christian Church, a place to believe, belong, and become. And whether you are in person or online, we are so glad that you are joining us this morning. I want to ask every single person to take that Connect card. It is in the seat back in front of you. Go ahead and fill that out. Maybe you've got some some prayer requests. Maybe you've got some information changes. This is a great way for our church to stay in contact with you. And you can go ahead and drop these in any one of our offering boxes out in our lobbies. If today is your first time worshiping with us, we want to say thank you so much for choosing to be here. You can take the Connect card out to Connecting Point, and we have a free gift for you just as our way of saying, hey, thank you so much for joining us. And if you are online, you can text the word new to the number on the screen, and we will literally mail you a free gift just as our way of saying, hey, thank you for being here today. Uh, I do want to thank you guys so much if you came ready to give. I want to thank you so much for your tithes and your offerings. It is because of your tithes and your offerings that we as a church are able to do what we do, not just here in South Florida, but across the globe. We are reaching so many, so many people. And so if you came ready to give, you can give in any one of our offering boxes, or you can give online at communitycc.com slash give. And again, thank you so much for your giving. I've got two announcements, and then we're going to hear a great message from Pastor Scott. But this first one is just for the ladies. Ladies, this Friday from 7 to 9, we have our Women's Holiday Market. It is here in our next-gen building. There's going to be unique gifts and crafts. There's going to be hot cocoa. There's going to be friends. We want you to bring someone with you and come enjoy just a fun, festive part of the holiday season. Maybe you buy some stuff for for Christmas if you're interested. But we are so excited about what's going to happen this Friday from 7 o'clock p.m. till 9 o'clock p.m., over in our next gen building. And then speaking of the holiday season, we've got our toy drive coming up. And I could tell you more, but I think this video will do a better job. Check this out. Hey community, Christmas is right around the corner and we are excited to partner once again with four kids of South Florida for their annual Gift of Hope toy drive. Please join us as we collect toys and gift cards to ensure that every child in foster care receives a present to open on Christmas morning. You can shop in person for a toy or gift card at your favorite store and then drop off your unwrapped gift at the church on or before November 24th. Or you can shop online using the Amazon charity list and the gift and gift card will be shipped directly to the four kids offices. Pick up a shopping list in the lobby or go to communitycc.com slash outreach. Whichever way you decide to give, know that a child will be impacted by your generosity this Christmas season. Well, hey, community, how are you guys doing today? You guys doing well? Hope you're doing well. I want to welcome everyone who's in the room and those of you that are watching online. I have a lot of people watch online every week. And uh, Tamarack, let's welcome our Pompano Beach Lighthouse Point campus. Love you guys. So glad that you guys are with us uh, for this service as well. Well, technically you have to have two messages to have a series. You can't have like a one week series. So I, I did once, but it wasn't technically a series. So, but the series is ending. We have a two week series called Blessings. And this is part two of the Blessings series. And uh, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about how to be more blessed. And it's Jesus himself that gives us the formula for more blessing Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, he tells us what Jesus said. It doesn't appear anywhere in the Gospels, but he tells us that Jesus said this. He said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And we know that. I mean, if we've ever given, we know there's a great blessing that comes from that. So just kind of hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to it in in a way uh, later on the message. But as we get started today, I want to ask you a question. Are you a risk taker or a security seeker? You don't have to respond to that, but you are going to be given an opportunity to respond to some certain things that maybe you've done that demonstrate that you are a risk taker. Are you a risk taker or a security seeker? There's something about taking a risk that just, you know, just gets the, the heart racing. And so raise your hand on this, and I'm going to mix it up 
to go from riskier things and some less, some more, but we're gonna start off whitewater rafting. Raise your hand if you've ever whitewater rafted, okay? Quite a few of us. I, I've done that probably four or five times because I was in student ministry and would take students. We did it with our family once too. Parasailing, raise your hand if you've ever done parasailing. Okay, okay a few of us. My hand is up, one and done on that one. So uh, <laughs> I did it before all the craziness that happened in South Florida. I go, I don't think I'm gonna do that again. All right, skydiving, anybody, raise your hand. Okay, I'm glad that you're with us still, you know. Uh, <laughs> There's no way, no way, no way I would ever have somebody push me out of a plane. There's no way I'm jumping out of a plane. Mountain climbing and rappelling. Anybody? Okay, got a few. I did that when I was a teenager, so that's good. Uh, bungee jumping. Anybody ever do that back in the day when that was a thing? Not me. Again, no way, no how am I doing bungee jumping. Uh, jet skiing. Pretty mild on the adventure scale. Probably quite a few hands going up. I've done that a number of times. Zip lining. A little more. Uh, okay, my hand's going up on that one too. Snow skiing, yep, my hand's up. Uh, not, a, not really great mountains down here in South Florida, but still I've uh, been able to do that. Mountain biking, anybody do that? I know we have some mountain bikers, okay, good. You know, I would do that, but I don't have a bike and I don't have a mountain, but if I had both, I would, I would do that. I would, I would enjoy that a little bit. <laughs> um, cliff diving, anybody? Cliff diving? Halfway cliff jumping, I've jumped off of some cliffs before. Swimming with the sharks, anybody? Okay, my hand is up on that. <laughs> One and done, so, all right. And this is the craziest thing of all. I mean, if, if you've done this, you are a risk taker. Eating Taco Bell after midnight, anybody? <laughs> okay. Wow, kudos to you. Uh, I neither confirm nor deny if I've ever done that, okay? I'm just saying, okay, you are the ultimate risk taker, so. If you were paying attention, you might see that there's a correlation on some of the things that I've done with a fear of heights. Uh, no skydiving, no bungee jumping, okay? Parasailing, yes. Well, there's a reason for that. We were on a cruise one time, and usually there's excursions, and Lori and I almost always do excursions, but we went to a place where we'd been before, and we'd done all the excursions. There was nothing left to do, and we're just kind of sitting on the beach, like for three or four hours off the ship, and I, so I wandered around, and I, I was looking, and, and it looks like there was a parasailing opening, and I, and I, I go, my mom and dad did this when they were in their 50s, you know, or early 60s, and so anyway, I felt like shamed by my parents, and so I, I decided to say, hey, Lori, you want to do parasailing? She goes, what? Because she knows I have this fear of heights, and so we did it, and I got to tell you, because it was, you know, I rationalized it was over water, and water is nice, and it feels like concrete if you're falling from 400 feet, from what I understand, not that I've ever done that, but, you know, it was so serene, and, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I was a little anxious. I mean, that was us when we were parasailing, and uh, the next slide is the, the guide, and I was a little anxious when I saw him. I don't know if you can read that. Parasailing for dummies. I mean, he's like reading about this, this little spoof thing that he did. I got a photo of him on that, so. Zip lining, probably not a big deal for some of you. Not a big deal for Lori. She doesn't have a, feel of, a fear of height. She's adventurous, but I gotta tell you, zip lining, this is Lori zip lining right here in this next photo. It was, it was done on a ship on Royal Caribbean. And I'm not saying this so I get any perks on Royal Caribbean, but if I do, uh, my email address is, no, I'm kidding you. So anyway, we were on this, and it was at the back of the ship, and you'd go from one side to the other. It's 10 stories up. Lori just said, I'm gonna do this. I'm going, oh my word. You know, my heart was racing doing this when, in the next photo when I did this, and she goes, why are you doing this? And I said, because I wanna be able to tell this story in a sermon one day. And I gotta tell you, it was not worth it. <laughs> you know, it's just not, you know. So anyway, I, I did it, and uh, uh, that was kind of a little bit more adventurous than, than I wanted. And um, one of the wildest things we ever did is when we were on a, we've been on a bunch of cruises. We went on a cruise and we went to the Cayman Islands one time, and a friend told us about Stingray City. And there's this place out in the middle of the ocean. You can't tell that, but it's in the middle of the ocean, and there are probably like eight or 10 um, excursion boats that all just kind of come around in a circle. And the stingrays, they just show up. Why? Because people feed them. They're not in a cage. They're just out in the middle of the ocean and you feed them squid and they can, sometimes they'll take them and they'll put them on your back and they'll slurp on your back, which is really kind of weird. But anyway, all kind, 
Stingray City was incredible, and we've done that at least twice. I would do that again. But that's not the wildest thing that we ever did. We were, we were snorkeling, and the, it was a small boat, and, and the guide asked us if we wanted to swim with sharks. <laughs> and I go, huh? And he said, do you want to swim with sharks? And I go, maybe. And so they started chumming the water around this boat in the middle of the ocean now. I mean, it's not like in a little protected area. I've seen like swim with sharks, like in the Bahamas and somebody's holding onto a shark and you touch it. This is not that. This is, that's an actual photo. I mean, if I wanted to give you a good, that's a horrible quality photo, but I took it with like a little instamatic kind of water camera. But those were the sharks and, and uh, the, the JV guide, you know, jumped in. But I asked the guide, I said, Stumpy, is this safe to do this? <laughs> And Stumpy said, yeah, they don't bite much. And so his name wasn't Stumpy. But anyway, the next part is a thousand percent true. I mean, it was great. Lori is so adventurous. But she said, hey, Scott, why don't you go ahead and jump in first? And if it's okay, then I'll come in in about five minutes. And I go, really? <laughs> really? So that's what this for better, for worse part was talking about, I'm guessing. So, you know, I, I jump in and I'm kind of swimming around these sharks. And uh, Lori doesn't even take, she's like in in a minute. She just looks like, okay, it looks good. And she's swimming around and I'm praying, Lord, help these to be vegan sharks. Please, 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 you know. But we did it. And then on the other side of that, I go, you know what? That was probably not the smartest thing I've ever done. You know, I, I, I would not ever do that again, but that was just kind of kind of crazy. Are you a risk taker or a security seeker? Many of you are greater risk takers than you think that you are because uh, Monday through Friday, you risk your life driving on 95. <laughs> you know, you, yeah, you're a risk taker. You are. Now, some people just love risk-taking. They love envelope pushing. They love adventure sports. They love the adrenaline, the escape, the ordinary, and I get all that, and I, I, I enjoy that, you know, for the most part, um, as long as it doesn't in, involve super heights, and so, but many of us are not risk-takers. Many of us in this room, we're just security seekers, committed to a lifestyle of playing it safe, and we, we hedge our bets, we, we cover our tracks, we touch all the bases, I mean... From being overinsured to eating low fat diets with kale salads. Many of us just want to minimize all the risk out of life. And we don't mind the idea of taking risk as long as it's somebody else that's doing the taking. We want a life that is free from uncertainty and pressure. I haven't shared this quote in a while, I don't think, uh, at least a year or two, but it, it's a quote that changed my life. It really did, and it changed this church. Keith Johnstone, some of you know what I'm gonna say right before I say it. There are people who prefer to say yes. There are people who prefer to say no. Those who say yes are rewarded by the adventures they have, and those who say no are rewarded by the safety they attain. We're gonna look at a passage of scripture that may surprise you today. It's called the parable of the talents. And it may surprise you that in this passage of scripture, Jesus is actually encouraging his followers to take risk financially. Take a risk with their money. Now, most of us are, that have been following Jesus for a while, we're pretty familiar with this, that we've lost the challenge of it. There's a familiarity that just we don't see what the original audience saw. We know that if you don't, Use it, you lose it. We know that we're gonna have to give an account to God one day for our lives and our actions. We know all that. But in this parable, Jesus is challenging us to live a lifetime of risking and adventure and action for his sake. He just is. And he's calling us to take risk with, I was gonna say our money, but he's calling us to take risk with his money that he's entrusted to us for a season. And that may be one of the hardest, most needed lessons that comfort conscious Christians need to learn. It's, it's a lesson that carries with it the potential for incredible growth and also wild adventure. It's what he calls us to. So we're gonna look at the three different characters in 
what is known as the parable of the talents. We're gonna be in Matthew chapter 25. If you have your Bible, go ahead and jump there. We're gonna be in two different versions, primarily the NIV to start off with, then the New Living Translation, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. It's called the parable of the talents. And there are three characters, well, there's four. There's the master, but there's three other individuals uh, that are in this parable, and every person in this room can identify with, with one of the three. And I want you to see and identify, self-identify which one you are as we go through this because it calls us to take appropriate financial risk with the money, his money that he's given to us. So Matthew 25, 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Now that's the NIV. And I had all these verses in the NIV and I go, you know what? I think, I think it's translated right, but it just confuses the point. Because from this point on, like as we go to the next verse, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. Now, if you have the NIV, it says five talents, two talents, and one talents, and that is correct. It's exactly the word that Jesus used. But it's not what we think he's talking about. Because when we think of talents, what do you think of? What do I think of? Gifts, abilities, skills. Man, she's got talent. I mean, the vocal range. He's got talent. You see him catch that football. He's talent or gifts and abilities. And so we think that he's talking about gifts and abilities, and he's not. Primarily, he's talking about, he's talking about money because a talent was a measurement, a weight of silver. So that's why I'm, I'm using the NLT as we go through this. But that's why it's like, why does it say the five talent person and it never mentions talent? It does in the other translations. But I don't want us to get confused what Jesus was really communicating because the original audience, when they heard, when he said talent, they didn't think skills and abilities. They thought money because that's what he was talking about. So verse 15, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip, and this is a parable, means it didn't actually happen. Jesus is creating this story to communicate very important truth to his listeners. Verse 16, the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used what? His money. It was his money. It's an important point in this story. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. Now, technically, it wasn't a small amount. It was a very significant amount. A talent was a very significant amount and he had five talents, five significant bags, not like little bags of silver. But from the master's perspective, it was small. From the servant's perspective, it was huge what had been trusted to him. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. So I first want, I want to look at the five-talent person. The five-talent person doubled his money. He put their money to use. It gained five more. Now some of us in this room, some of you, you're five-talent people because everything about you is, is more. I mean, more money and more responsibility, more expectations, more pressure, more opportunity, more scrutiny, and frankly, more temptation because you have more. The scripture warns us about the danger of money. It says, for money is the root, no, it doesn't say for money is the root of all evil. What is it? It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. That verse is often misquoted. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. I mean, the truth is there's challenges that come with money and with wealth, but here's a parable that should be a source of encouragement to those of you who have more, those of you who have more resources, those of you who are five talent people, because in this parable that Jesus is telling, the rich person is the hero. Oftentimes the rich person is the villain in different stories, but not this time. The owner said to the man who had doubled his talents and now had 10 Said in verse 21, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. Well done, well done. 
And for those of you who are five talent people, God has entrusted you with wealth. Not to indulge it, not, not to hoard it up. He has blessed you. And I pray that you'll recognize that God has just blessed you. Not, not to raise your standard of living necessarily, but to raise your standard of giving. There's a slogan in the investment world that says, weigh the risk versus the reward. And I don't think the five talent person in this story took a wild investment in wheat futures. I don't think they went to the casino at the Lost Baghdad Strip and put all five on red and said, spin the wheel. I, I don't think this person was a day trader. I mean, these were calculated risks. They were responsible risks. And he multiplied what was entrusted to him over a period of time. Proverbs 14, 23 says, hard work brings a profit. The wealth of the wise is their crown. Now, if you are a five talent person, the Lord's challenge to you, frankly, it's not short term because you have resources to cover short term. And there's not the stress that two talent people have and one talent people have in the short term, but you're, you're challenged. Your risk is in the long term, that you just don't hoard it all, that, that you risk. You, you risk for eternity and, and, and you give chunks of it away. And, and if I'm talking to you today and, and some of you are thinking, he's not talking to me. You know, so <laughs> if I'm talking to you today and you're a five talent person financially now, have you given chunks of it away? Because I believe that's what Jesus is calling you to do. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 in the Sermon on the Mount, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then he says this, we talked about this last week in part one, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A wise old preacher said, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And what does that mean? Well, it means you invest in eternity to be honest, it's not all that risky for a five-talent person to put money into ordinary investments of this world. I mean, it's kind of normal. I mean, you monitor the progress of it on a regular basis. The real risk is not the short term, it's the long term. It's to give chunks of it away and to trust that God's word is true, that God will provide for you as you trust him and as you, as you honor him. You're laying up treasure in heaven and here's the truth, a five talent person can be an incredible blessing to the kingdom of God. And I'm blessed to know one talent and two talent and five talent people. And some of the most generous people that I know are one talent and two talent and five talent people. And because five talent people who have resources, they can be such an incredible blessing to the kingdom of God. We read in the book of Acts, which is the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, it was the beginning of the church, about how Barnabas sold a field that he owned. And we read in verse 36, Joseph, and this is interesting, Joseph is his name, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas. Barnabas is not his name. He's Joe. But they called him Barnabas. They nicknamed him. Wow. Which means son of encouragement. How awesome to get a nickname. The son of encouragement. That, that's much better than the anti-Barnabas. <laughs> you know, the son of discouragement. What we call today Debbie Downer. I mean, those are not positive nicknames. But he had this positive nickname, Barnabas. and He was a five-talent person. Financially. He enabled the church to serve the poor because he gave it away. He gave it away. A five-talent person can be a tremendous encouragement to God's kingdom if that person loves the Lord enough to take the ultimate risk with their money and give chunks of it away. And when we're grateful, which is the month of November, gratitude to God turns what we have into enough. <laughs> That's one of my most frequently quoted statements. I'm saying that for me. Gratitude turns what we have into enough. You're content with what you have. Paul wrote to his protege Timothy, for we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. And so we just realize that it's not our money, it's his money. He's entrusted it to us, and we need to be a good steward. And so 
we return some now and big chunks throughout our lives. And what are we saving it for? Who wants to be a hoarder? Because when we move beyond saving to hoarding, I think the real issue there becomes a failure to trust God. Now, here's another issue. Sometimes we tell the Lord if we could just win $10 million from the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes, it's still a thing. I didn't know that it was. I went ahead and Googled it. It's still a thing. Kind of, they've gone under the radar, but they're still doing it. And we say, I, if I could win $10 million from the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes, I would give, I'd be a reverse tither. I'd give $9 million to the Lord. I'd just keep a million to myself. Keep a, that's all I want, just one. But here's a humbling phrase in this story that Jesus told in Matthew 25, verse 15. Jesus said, he gave to each one according to what? To his ability. And the NCV says, to each one as much as he could handle. As he could handle. I, I think when we think about what we can handle, we, we underestimate our ability to handle adversity. We say, I, I could never go through that. I could never handle that. And we do, with the Lord's help. But we overestimate our ability to handle prosperity. We just do. It was a number of years ago, I was talking to a friend who's a part of the church. And I mean, he, he was working maybe two jobs. He was just really working hard, but having a hard time getting ahead. And, and we're talking to him about finances and resources and things like that. And, and I, just, I just told him, I said, you know what? I, I heard somebody said that for every 100 people who could handle adversity, only one can handle prosperity. I always remember what he said, Scott, I'm willing to take that risk. <laughs> right? I, yeah, I know, right? I mean, I'm, I'm willing to take it. Well, maybe because God is a good, good father, He's not willing to take that risk for us. Why? Because we haven't demonstrated that we would handle it well. If, if we want more, we need to handle less well because it's, it's his money. And so it says he gave to each one as, as he could handle. Remember what Jesus, the master, said in this story? You have been faithful with a few things, I'll put you in charge of many things. And so the corollary is true. If you're not faithful with a few things, if you're not faithful with less, Jesus said, why would I give you more? And that's another verse and didn't include it just because of time. And God knows what we can handle. Now let's look at the two, hand, the two talent person. I can more readily identify with the two talent person in this parable. And 25 verse 22, the servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I've earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. Again, big amount, big amount to the two-talent person, but small to the master. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Person with two talents gained two more. And I, I know that I'm talking to a lot of two-talent people financially in this room today. I mean, you're not wealthy. You're not in the top 1% of our country, you're not wealthy by the standards of this culture, you don't have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, you're not a millionaire, I mean, you're a thousandaire, <laughs> you know, you have some thousands, but, but you've been blessed, you're able to pay your bills and you have a comfortable life. And Now there are multiple temptations for a two talent person. First of all, you can resent the five talent person. Instead of being grateful, to God for his gifts to you, gratitude turns what we have into enough. No, we, we, we resent the five talent person and we, we sh shift into comparison mode. And when we compare, we become envious. And it was Roosevelt who said that comparison is the thief of joy. And if you lean constantly into comparison, you're just robbing yourself of joy that Jesus wants you to have. And so you can compare or not compare so much, but compete and then get yourself in serious debt. You can be bitter because you don't live in a $1.5 million house, you don't drive a $95,000 car, you don't fly to exotic places for vacation. Or... And in the church, you can be intimidated and refuse to make any contribution because there's others who could do more. Some much, much more. The Bible says in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. And jealousy and resentment are just kind of signs of, of greed. Proverbs 28, 25, a greedy man stirs up dissension, but he who trusts in the Lord will prosper. 
The other temptation is, it's not so much to, to compare or to compete, but it's to condescend. <laughs> to have a condescending spirit to the one talent person. Because you have more, you kind of look down on the person who has less and thinking you're better. Jesus owned nothing except for the coat on his back, the greatest person who's ever lived. Proverbs 28, verse six says, better to be poor and honest than to be rich and dishonest. God does not measure our worth by our net worth. He doesn't, but by our character. Now, I, I find it interesting in this parable that Jesus used the exact same language for the five talent person and the two talent person when they returned to the master what was his. And the master doesn't say to the five talent person, well, oh, wow, all right, how many did you get? You got two? Okay, you got five. Oh, you, five, you are my favorite. You rocked it, you, cr you crushed it, you, you did okay. No, he says the exact same language, why? Because they were just faithful. They were faithful what had been entrusted to them. One wasn't better than the other. God measures us by opportunity and ability and by our effort. If the one talent person had doubled his investment, there would have been the very same accolade, the very same words verbatim, I believe. Now, friends, if you're a two talent person, you have the responsibility to make the most of what God has entrusted to you. And and the first risk that God asks you to take with your money, it's not you know, a big lump sum amount or, or gift or donation like the five talent person, but it's a weekly tithe of your earnings. It's not about the long term so much, it's about the short term, it's the here and now. And Levit Leviticus 27, 30 says, a tithe of everything, it belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Deuteronomy 14, 22, be sure to set aside a tenth or one tenth so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Now, Malachi chapter three was written to people, many of whom were of very modest means. It reads like this, Malachi 3, 8. We usually start not with eight and nine, we usually go straight to 10. But in light of the context of this parable and something else, I thought it was important to read these other two verses. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. This is God saying this now. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse. The whole nation of you. Because you're robbing me. This is God saying to the people of modest means. The Jewish nation did not give God one-tenth. They owed God one-tenth. It automatically belonged to him. And when they decided that they weren't going to return to God what was his, then God said they were stealing from him by not giving it to him. Now the next verse is the, you know, it's the verse I usually read. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then God said, hey, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Now, I know, I know, I know for some of you that have not taken this step yet, the decision to tithe, to give one-tenth or 10% of your earnings or bonuses or income or whatever that might come your way, to the church that you're a part of is a huge step for you. But if you believe the Lord's promise, he says, test me in this, then, then, you, then you will trust him. God says, don't test me anywhere, but in the area of your finances, I want you to test me because you can trust me. You can trust me. I wanted to get current data, so I went online. There's a guy, kind of the George Gallup of the church named George Barna. He recently did a survey revealed that 21% of Christians who attend church on a regular basis, in person or online, uh, give 10% or more of their income to their local church, 21%. That, that's way higher than what I've heard. I'd heard, you know, over the last you know, 20, 30 years, it's like 5% or 10%. But, but I trust Barna's uh, methodology, and, and frankly, that was encouraging that Encouraging 21%? Yeah, it's encouraging uh, compared to what I've heard you know, before that. I, I believe that that number is much higher at community. I mean, I have no way of knowing. We have, we have hundreds and hundreds of families who tithe their income to the Lord. 
BC, before COVID, <laughs> we, we used to, sometimes when we do these, we'd have people fill out a card and they would just say, hey, my name's Scott Einan and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tithe or I'm gonna begin to tithe, I'm gonna continue to tithe, I'm gonna begin to give over the tithe, I'm gonna continue to give over the tithe. Those were the four categories, you know. And, and, and there's just hundreds and hundreds of families that would, you know, fall in line in some of those areas. And 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I, I know it's risky to tithe, I, I, I get that, I understand that, particularly for for two talent people financially. You probably have bills accumulated. You just don't see how you can afford to tithe. Your intent is to begin to tithe when you get the bills paid. And then you, if you have enough left, then you'll tithe. But then there'll be no risk. And where there's no risk, there certainly is there's no faith. And the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, well, without risk, <laughs> Without trust, it's impossible to please God. God promises us that if we give, he'll see to it that our needs are met. He, that's a promise that he makes to us. Now, I know that's risky. And, and, and some of us don't have a strong enough faith in God yet to believe that that is true. We just don't trust him enough yet, and, and I, I get that. And, my goal as your pastor is to help you to see that it is true, that you can trust him and encourage you in this area. And whenever we talk about this, oftentimes I'll say, hey, I, it's not I want something from you, I want something for you. I want you to be able to trust him. And then I want you to have a story. I want you to have a story that you know, that you know, that you know, that God is real and that he's intervened in your life and that he's provided for you in some kind of a tangible way. Somebody else might be skeptical of what actually happened. Oh, this is a coincidence. And you go, no, this is not a coincidence. This is God confirming to you that he's worthy of your trust. Now, I've been a two-talent person financially, you know, all my life, and frankly, um, it, it's been pretty easy for me to tithe, I'll be honest with you, because my parents taught me to do that when I was a little kid. My church taught me to do this over and above. I mean, we tithed, and then we gave to missions on top of that, and it was awesome, and I'm so thankful that that's a spiritual habit, a spiritual discipline that I have, so I don't have to wrestle with this. And, I, and that I know so many other people do, and I'm just thankful, but I, I get how hard that can be. But I just wanna tell you, you can't outgive God. He's, he's worthy of your trust, and God's opened the floodgates of heaven for those who trust him. Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So we determine the measure, and, when I stand before God one day, I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Anybody else want to hear that? Well done, good and faithful servant. And I talk about that from time to time. And I don't know if I've ever said this before. Because I, I had some kind of some aha moments this week in what would be a pretty, I'd call, um, predictable passage of scripture. I mean, I've taught this before. I knew <laughs> what it said but it just dawned on me in a big way this week that if I want to hear well done good and faithful servant then first of all Jesus is saying this in the context of the servant the one who was entrusted a talent who was entrusted money by the master the context is all financial in this entire parable it just is and so if I want to hear well done good and faithful servant then I, I need to be faithful and the way that I handle God's money. I need to do what he asked me to do. I need to give what he asked me to do if I wanna hear this. Now, I believe that that principle transcends money, but let's not miss the context here. Jesus is talking about money to these people, and that's what they're hearing. And that's what they understand. And I, I want to hear that. That's why I, I want to be, be more than faithful in the way I handle God's money. Because I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now let's look at the one talent person. The one talent person took no risk. He, he buried the talent in the ground. Now he did the one thing right. He acknowledged that it was his master's money. 
but he made some serious mistakes. First of all, he was self-pitying, verse 24. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate. It's not my fault. (laughs) I mean, I'm the victim here. He was fearful. Verse 25, I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid in the earth. Look, here's your money back. I I couldn't take any risk. That's how afraid I was. But Jesus didn't buy that in this story that he's created. Because the servant was lazy. The master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops that I didn't cultivate. So Jesus is contrasting here. Good and faithful, wicked. Good, wicked, faithful, lazy. In the context of resources there, such an indictment undermines this servant's claim for purity of motives. And he was unimaginative, verse 27. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I couldn't have, I could have got some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. So the one talent person was condemned for what? For poor stewardship. Take one talent from him and give it to the one who has 10. Now, most of the gospel message is very compassionate to the poor. But here's an example where the poor man is not the hero. What is Jesus talking about here? I think he's wanting to tell us that wherever we're at on the resource spectrum, one or two or three or four or five or 10 or 20 talents, wherever we're at, there's accountability. Nobody can say, look, I'm not the five, and I'm not even a two-talent person. I've got nothing. So this doesn't apply to me. And Jesus said, yeah, it does. It does apply to you. I want to speak a little bit to those of you who consider yourselves poor. We talked about that last week. I mean, none of us are poor compared to the rest of the planet. But compared to other people in South Florida, then, I mean, some people are going to be at different places on the spectrum, so I get that, and Maybe you're elderly, maybe you're on a fixed income, maybe you're just starting out, maybe you're unemployed, maybe your income is very low. And This parable teaches that being poor does not exempt us from the need of making the most of what God has entrusted to us. We're faithful with a little, and then he may entrust us with more. We're to work hard, to earn, we're to spend wisely, and we're to give. The book of of Leviticus, that book in the Old Testament... It says that people were to bring when they send a lamb to the temple for sacrifice. And so it says in Leviticus 5, 7, but if you cannot afford to bring a sheep, you bring to the Lord two turtle doves or two young pigeons as the penalty for your sin. If you can't afford a lamb, if you can't afford a sheep, it doesn't say, well, if you can't afford that, then don't worry about it. Just, no. God says, you bring something. That's important. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on every Lord's day, each of you should put aside some amount of money in relation to what you've earned and save it for this offering. Now, if if you're a one-talent person financially, don't be intimidated by those who have more, but also don't rationalize that since you don't have much that you won't give anything. That's certainly not the message of the Bible. Uh, According to George Barna, again, went to his website on stewardship trends and giving and generosity And according to Barna, 25% of people who attend church on a regular basis, in person or online, 25% do not give any money to their church. None. Ever. I have no idea what that percentage is here. But friend, just hear me. If if that is you, you need to give. Not, Not for the church. You need to give for you. That's what God wants you to do. That's what God is calling you to do. Jesus calls you to give. A story that we hear from the time we were kids, if we grew up in Sunday school, a little boy, Jesus teaching thousands of people, a little boy brought, he brought five biscuits and two bluegill or five pieces of bread and two fish and Jesus took the little lunch and he multiplied it and he fed 5,000 people, 5,000 men, probably 18 to 20,000 people. Little becomes much when it's given to Jesus. 
this is what I, I it might sound disrespectful, and maybe it is, I don't know, so I've got to be careful. This is a, a story that you hear when you're a kid, and you know the story, and it has a value to it, and I've referenced it a number of times through the years, never really unpacked it, never really studied it. Jesus stood at the temple, watched what people were dropping in the offering plate. He watched the, the wealthy give lots of resources and he watched with the eye of forgiveness. He watched with the eye of expectation. And then a widow came and he brought the disciple. Hey, 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 watch this. And she dropped two mites into the offering container. And it was all, it was all that she had. And Jesus didn't stop her and say, man, man wait, 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 man, look, I know you don't have any, I know you're given 100% of what you have. You don't need to do that. Just, just love God. Jesus doesn't say that. He commended her. In fact, we read in Mark 12, 43, I tell you that this poor widow put more in the offering box than all the others. For the others put in what they had to spare their riches, but she, poor as she is, put in all she had. She gave all that she had to live on. And that is a great example. And I've referenced it about sacrificial giving. That was a few years ago. Actually taught on the passage, didn't just reference it. You know, like a quick thing like I'm doing today, but I taught on it. So I said, I want to learn. So I learned about giving in the New Testament at the temple. I learned about all these things. And then one, one commentary, just one out of everything that I read, blew my mind. And I actually, in the middle of this, I just pushed away from my keyboard and I'm going, Oh my word, this is what I discovered. I did not know this. When did this happen? When did this account of Jesus watching this widow give the two mites? It was less than 48 hours before he would be crucified. Less than 48 hours. It was the Wednesday of Passion Week, and Passion means suffering. Palm Sunday, Sunday, Wednesday, he takes his disciples. He said, I want you to watch this. Jesus, the next day, he would have the Garden of Gethsemane when he would, he would sweat drops of blood, hematidrosis because of the pressure. And so he's carrying the weight of the world. 48 hours later, he knows he's gonna be hanging on a cross and he's telling his disciples, look at her. Why would Jesus do that? I, I can think of a thousand other things that he would do other than watching someone give. Well, you can speculate just like I can, and I, I haven't like, spent that much time, but two quick thoughts that come to mind is one, uh, Jesus knew that money and possessions would always be his biggest rival. <laughs> so he wants to make sure that everyone Everyone, wherever they're at on the resource spectrum, whether they have a lot or a little, they know that we need to trust him. And, and, and I, he said that in different places, but he wanted this example. But I, I think because 48 hours before he was gonna go, he said, look, I, I want my disciples to see this because I want them to tell her story because her story matters about trusting him with our resources. In the parable of the talents, the, the, five, the, the, the five and the two and the one, you know when that happened? Same day. So Jesus is, he's talking about generosity and then he wants to have this generosity story of this widow's mind less than 48 hours before he's crucified. I gotta tell you, this is, this is so powerful to me that he wants to make sure that we don't get it. I mean, that we don't miss it. So we'll hear, well done, a good and faithful servant. Well done. You've been faithful in the way that you've handled my resources. Well done. Years ago, Gordon Cosby was pastor of the Church of the Savior in Washington, D.C. One day, a deacon shared a concern with him. It seemed that there was a very poor widow in their church. She had six children. And the deacons discovered that she was giving $4 a month to their church. This was a number of years ago now. And that $4 a month was actually a tithe of her total monthly income. She was destitute. She was poverty stricken. 
to the point that the deacons felt that she could not afford to give this much. So they decided that the pastor should call on her and assure her that they felt that she was under no obligation to give anything to the church. They understood that poverty that she had was just so difficult. They, they wanted to relieve her of the obligation. So I've always remembered this story. I had to go find it. It just kind of came to mind. I told this one years ago. The pastor said, I am not wise now. I was less wise then. I went and I told her of the concern of the deacons. I told her so graciously and as supportively as I knew how that she was relieved of any responsibility of giving. And as I talked, tears started streaming down her cheeks. She said, Pastor, I, I wanna tell you that you are taking away the last thing that gives my life dignity and purpose. That's a powerful story. God wants everyone to give, not because he needs it, not because this church needs it, but wherever we're at on the spectrum, he wants everyone to give because we need to give. We just do. Friends, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he had to open his hands to receive the nails. And when we understand what Jesus did for us on the cross, when we understand that, that our sins were nailed there, and when we accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord, and, and we become a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God comes into our life, and the Spirit of God begins to open up our hands too. Hands of generosity, hands of obedience, hands of trust, hands of surrender. And we don't give out of obligation or duty. We, we give. We give because Jesus gave his best to us. 27-year-old, 28-year-old missionary to Ecuador was murdered. He was a martyr by the name of Jim Elliott. And Jim Elliott said he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for today. I, I, I thank you for the new learnings for me, Father, as I, as I, I love studying your word and finding out things that, that are aha moments and new for me. And God, I, I thank you that, wow, Jesus was so concerned about us and our loyalty to him that just 48 hours before he died for us, he, he talked about this because he wants us to get this right. So Father, I, I pray for those who are in this room today, especially those who have not taken steps in this area, but considering, honoring you with their tithe. God, I pray that your, your spirit would just nudge and prompt and say, it's okay, you can trust me. I want you to have a story. Father, I, I thank you that two days later, Jesus did go to that cross, that he suffered, that he died. But Father, I thank you that three days later, he conquered death, victorious to give us life and hope and a future. And Father, I, I thank you for that. I thank you that we can follow Jesus and I pray that you would help us to follow in his name every day in every way, and it's in Jesus' name and for his sake that we pray today, amen. Would you stand with us? Darkness, you. 
Again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I do want to throw it out there. If you heard the message this morning and you realize you don't have that relationship with Christ that you were looking for, we want to invite you. Come forward. We would love to pray for you. Maybe today's the day that you accept Christ. Our baptistry is ready. We've got clothes in the back, towels in the back. We are ready for you. But for the rest of us, let's go and let us live in such a way this week where God would look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Have a great week, guys. Thank you.